Well, hello everyone and welcome uh, to the elaborate event, uh, the virtual one 2020. Um, well, my name is Minya uh, and I'm a PG candidate um, for a Sherwood lab at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Howard Medical School. And today I'll be talking to you about our latest work on uh, remdesivir, like elucidating a DR remdesivir cell toxicity using the CRISPR screen and um, because um, you cannot ask me directly questions if you have any inquiries and would like to know a little bit more about this work uh, you can find a preprint on bio archive uh, of our lab if we get started um, remdesivir uh, this is a pre-existing -pre drug developed for Ebola and Marburg. And remdesivir here is um, a nucleoside analog. And the way it acts when it enters the cell, uh, it first transforms into its active metabolite, and then it interferes with the action of uh, viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So it competes with ATP, and it gets integrated into the uh, viral RNA, and that will cause the evasion of proofreading by viral exonucleases, and it will cause a decrease in viral RNA production. So this drug is an antiviral drug, uh, and the reason why we got um, interested in studying it, it's because it has, it has shown some in vitro efficacy against uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, but also it has shown some in view efficacy in mouse and macaque models. So as I said, it's a pre-existing drug and it's been clinically approved, but um, so while clinical data suggests that remdesivir is generally safe for human use, um, remdesivir has shown some cytotoxicity. So the causes and mechanism of toxicity are not fully known. Uh, and we wanted to study that a bit more so this is important point to make, uh, and it's unclear whether the amount that could be given to a patient, it's limited by the toxicity of remdesivir itself. So we wanted to know, actually to study the metabolism of remdesivir within the cells um, and understand how the drug is being metabolized. And this would help us understand which patients might have uh, problems metabolizing it once it's uh, been administrated to them. And then the second one is the uh, toxicity itself. And the point of this is that if we could limit the toxicity caused by remdesivir, maybe we could give higher doses to patients. Um, okay, so to so we got interested in studying the mechanism by which remdesivir affects host cells and induces cytotoxicity. And to do that, we um, decided to do RNA-seq and genome-wide CRISPR screen on the two liver and two intestinal cell lines that we treated with remdesivir. So I just want to point out here that we know and we agree that like um, cell lines are not the best model to study toxicity of a drug. And although doing uh, this same research with primary cells or with organoids or having uh, an animal model would be much better, uh, still this high throughput screens that we were performing require the cells to grow very fast and we were quite time limited. So everything has its perks and its downs. So we decided to go and um, work with this um, two liver and two intestinal cell lines. Uh, and the reason why we chose them is that because these organs are mostly affected um, by the remdesivir toxicity. So RNA-seq has been previously employed to characterize drug me mechanisms. Uh, and uh, CRISPR screens have been used to identify the genetic pathways that dr uh, drive cancer drug resistance. Uh, but to our knowledge, none of these two uh, have been used before to study the toxicity of the remdesivir. So we have these four cell lines that we treat with remdesivir, and then uh, we perform RNA-seq at 8 and 24 hours and 
as expected here, you can see that um, RNA-seq gene expression clusters most strongly by the cell line, and next one would be by the drug exposure. So there is a clear evidence of uh, different And um, important to say is that there are no strong peripatetic gene expression signatures. So this validates that our dosing and duration in our experiments are correct and that everything that we are observing is solely due to remdesivir treatment since um, it induces this distinct host gene expression response. Um, so to investigate which genes and pathways uh, change expression as a result of this remdesivir treatment, we performed the gene set enrichment analysis. Um, this is a computational method that helps you to determine whether a defined set of genes uh, shows a statistically significant uh, difference between two biological states, in this case, um, our control and our remdesivir treatment. And we identified a set of highly significant gene ontology pathways affected by remdesivir in each of these four cell lines that we were working on. And so this clear uh, concordance in the pathways regulated by remdesivir across all the four cell lines that we were using, and that they, these pathways differ from the pathways induced by a, a control and HCQ treatment suggesting that each drug has a signature impact on a cell uh, physiology. So what you see on the left here is a GCA plot where basically each one of the sticks is showing a gene and it's ranking among all of the other genes. So what you see is that for genes involved in mitochondrial respiration, they're more off and they're more down, like, down regulated than up regulated. And this allows us to do gene by gene analysis, whose results you can see here on the right. So the main drug-specific gene expression response of remdesivir is this significant decrease in the mitochondrial respiratory gene expression. And you can see on the right here that remdesivir strongly represses uh, nuclear genes that encode for mitochondrial respiratory complex 1, 3, 4, and 5, as well as other genes that encode um, mitochondrial localized proteins, uh, but it does not significantly impact the expression of genes encoded by the mitochondrial genome itself. Um, so now we know that uh, remdesivir acts on gene expression like this. We wanted to. We know what happens on the gene expression level, but we wanted to see and determine the functional impact of remdesivir. Um, on this mitochondrial gene expression. So we performed uh, flow symptometric measurements, uh, two kinds of them, uh, ATP-RED and MITRAS 580. So on the left, you can see the results of ATP-RED. And ATP-RED is just a dye, a red fluorescent dye, and it's a probe for ATP. So once it is administrated to the cells, um, it enters the mitochondria of living cells and it targets the ATP. And this way we can measure the ATP levels. So you can see on the left here that the cell lines that are treated with remdesivir significantly decrease the production of the ATP. And on the right, you have the results of uh, MITRAS 580. So MITRAS is just this super oxide sensitive dye. Um, and it's localizing in mitochondria as well. Uh, once in it's ad administrated to the cells, um, it will, this dye will be um, oxidated by superoxide and it's specific to superoxide from mitochondria. It will not be reactive to the other um, reactive oxygen species in the cells. So you can also see that there is a decrease um, in the uh, uh, mitochondrial respiration uh, once the cells are treated with remdesivir. Um, so given that remdesivir decreases the expression of the genes involved in mitochondrial respiration and ATP production, we asked whether the drugs that affect mitochondrial uh, oxidative phosphorylation can impact 
the remdesivir cytotoxicity. So we set a set of five drugs that were previously known to impact mitochondrial function and found that uh, remdesivir cytotoxicity in cells is uh, quite mitigated by uh, this drug called uh, cyrosyncopine, uh, which is a lactate transporter inhibitor that downregulates the mitochondrial reactivity. So once we treat the cells with cyrosyncopine and with remdesivir, we have the, this like mitigation of the remdesivir cytotoxicity. Then the next drug that we used uh, is called um, urzodesoxycholic acid. And this drug has been shown to improve the mitochondrial function. When we treat the, the um, cells with uh, urzodesoxycholic acid, uh, acid and um, um, remdesivir as well, we see that remdesivir cytotoxicity in cells is quite um, uh, exacerbated. And then we have these three next three drugs uh, that are affecti affecting mitochondrial activity. But once we administrate the remdesivir and these drugs, uh, there is no significant impact on the toxicity of remdesivir, which is a bit um, it a bit dampens our enthusiasm about our findings about this, just because one of these drugs, um, metformin. Uh, is known to downregulate as uh, the mitochondrial activity as well as cyrosyncopene does. So we have these two drugs that should have the same mechanism of action, but they do not produce the same results. So this might indicate that there is a bit of nuance in the way that this uh, toxicity is um, being shown. Um, so now we saw how does gene expression change after remdesivir treatment. We wanted to um, directly identify which genes are involved in remdesivir metabolism and cytotoxicity. So we performed a drug toxicity CRISPR screen. Uh, and the way we do this, we have a genome Y targeting CRISPR uh, library. Um, which is just a library of guide RNAs that are targeting over 20,000 genes, and each one of these genes are covered by four guides. Um, and then we treat the cells uh, with this library. We make sure that we select for the cells that have library integrated within them, and then we treat the cells um, with remdesivir and our control and wait to see what happens. So. After a while, we will have uh, some guide RNAs that will be depleted from population or enriched in our population. And genes whose knockouts will um, increase the drug toxicity, uh, those uh, guides RNA will be depleted in our population. And then those genes that knockout mitigates the drug, drug toxicity will be enriched in these remdesivir treated samples. So these are our results. And um, we run this uh, MedJack uh, pipeline to see what happens uh, and which guide RNA got enriched or depleted. By running this pipeline, we will have this kind of graph where you can see on the right and on the left, um, on the left would be genes whose knockout uh, will uh, increase the drug toxicity, and those guide RNAs will be depleted for our population. And uh, we observe this significant depletion of guide RNAs that are targeting cell essential genes after two weeks of um, drug or DMSO treatment, which is kind of nice because it just confirms that our CRISPR system is quite robust and it's working with cells. Uh, and on this um, left side, we have also a depletion of guide RNAs that are targeting genes involved in pure bisexuals. So this kind of makes sense because, as we said at the beginning, that remdesivir is a nucleoside analog, and once it enters the cells, it will compete with ATP for the integration in the viral RNA. So if we don't have these genes that are involved in pure biosynthesis, um, then there will be no competition with ATP, and the cells will uh, actually have this um, 
huge amount of remdesivir, and that will cause uh, the um, increase in drug toxicity. Um, and then on the right side here, we have guide RNAs um, that are targeting the genes that will help mitigate the drug toxicity. These guide RNAs will be enriched, and these are one of our top hits that we will cover now one by one. Um, so we performed this individual validation of guides that are targeting these six genes whose loss significantly mitigated remdesivir toxicity in the, our pool screen. Um, and all of these hits are confirming significant increase in CC50. Um, so if we go for the first one, the first was the guide RNA that was targeting CT. And CDSA is gene coding for catapsin A. And catapsin A is a first step in the processing of remdesivir. So it is an asterisk known to be involved in the intercellular activation of these nucleoside pro projects. And this provides um, a genetic confirmation that uh, CTSA is a primary enzyme uh, in the initial intercellular and desivir activation step. So once we have a knockout cell line of this gene, we were, um, we were able to see this increase in CC50 of the drug. Um, the next one would be KEEP1, uh, which uh, is involved in mitochondrial activity, and it also refers us back to our RNA-seq data. So guide RNAs that are targeting KIP1 show around 3.2-fold uh, increase in CC50. And uh, these knockouts should stabilize and activate the NRF2 transcription factor. This factor, when it's activated, is increasing a set of antioxidant stress response. Uh, and it's increasing the mitochondrial function and purine biosynthesis. And this suggests that RNF2 activation may protect against remdesivir toxicity. It kind of makes sense because if uh, our, um, NRF2 activation leads to increase in pure uh, purine sy synthesis, that will mean more ATP to compete with remdesivir and mitigate the toxicity of remdesivir itself. And we have these two next guide RNAs that are targeting um, two mitochondrial localized um, metabolic genes. And they're, um, the first one is AK2, it's um, um, adenylate kinase. And then the second one is this bidirectional nucleoside transporter, SLC2. And both of these guide RNAs are highly enriched in our pool screen. And we, when we do this individual validation of uh, these two guide RNAs, we see uh, the significant increase in CC15. So um, we have an SLC2 and AK2. Um, notably, this AK2 has been shown to be involved in the activation of the antiviral drugs, and uh, SLC2 knockdown has been shown to reduce the mitochondrial transport of some other uh, nucleotide analog drugs. So when we treat the knockouts of AK2 and when we treat the knockouts of SLC2 with remdesivir, we find that CC50 is dramatically increased and this suggests that these genes are common cellular mediators of um, remdesivir toxicity. So we had this quite easy scheme to start with, um, but then through our CRISPR screen, we were able to fill out a lot of these blank spots and things we didn't know before. And those are the steps in the metabolism and toxicity of remdesivir. So from this relatively simple picture, we were now coming to this a bit more complex much, with much more explanation of how this reacts with the cell. So these results that we had got us really excited because our genome wide screen is giving us these two mitochondrial genes 
that validate that we are sort of on the right track, right? Uh, and now we have these two mitochondrial genes that we know that are involved in toxicity, but could it be that they're also involved in metabolizing the drug? Um, so we wanted to know whether these two, AK2 and SLC2, are involved in the only in toxicity of the remdesivir, or are they involved in metabolizing the drug itself? And the way to answer this question, we came up is that we wanted to do a viral China a challenge assay. And to do that, we had the help of our collaborators. So uh, to address whether this loss of AK2 or SLC2 impacts the potency of remdesivir as an antiviral drug, we tested remdesivir response in this um, SARS-CoV-2 viral challenge assay. Um, so we have control cells and we have knockout cells, and they're treated with a range of remdesivir concentrations, and then they're infected with the viral supernatant. And then after 48 hours, we fixate the cells and do fish analysis, um, trying to detect this RNA from the SARS-CoV-2. And we found that SARS-CoV-2 IC50 for remdesivir is increased only slightly uh, by SLC2 knockout as compared to control guard RNA. But AK2 knockout induces a, this robust uh, increase in the remdesivir IC50. So it comes down to this, that for AK2, we observe this 22-fold change in both cytotoxicity but as well is in antiviral potency. So basically the implication is that those are connected and the reason why remdesivir is less toxic in AK2 knockout is just the fact that there is just less remdesivir there. Um, and now we show something that has not been shown before that AK2 is a remdesivir kinase that is required to activate remdesivir as a prodrug. So basically, if you do not have a functional AK2 kinase, uh, you will not have the active remdesivir form in the cell. But for SLC2, the main difference is between this eight-fold change in CC50 and 1.9-fold uh, change in the bottom left uh, viral ch challenge assay. So you can see here, in the bottom left that this is an argument that this is a target gene that might be an interesting um, drug candidate because it allows us to preserve the potency of remdesivir while at the same time it lowers the cytotoxicity of the remdesivir. So this in parallel would allow us um, for um, potential higher dose administration um, which is one of the problems when using the remdesivir. So we have this now full picture of how remdesivir acts in the cells. And our results suggest that targeting this um, bidirectional mitochondrial nucleoside transporter, SLC2, robustly reduces remdesivir uh, cytotoxicity. And we show through our genome-based approach uh, that remdesivir primary effect on the cell is reduction of mitochondrial respiratory gene expression of the genes transcribed from nuclear genome. Uh, we saw that there is reduction in mitochondrial respiration. We saw that there is also reduction in ATP production in mitochondria. And um, most interesting, interestingly, we found that um, the AK2 kinase is a kinase very important uh, for the remdesivir metabolism. And we show that this SLC2 is a potential target to reduce uh, toxicity of nucleoside drugs such as remdesivir. So one of the ways that we think this is happening is because uh, SLC2 here, you can see on the lower left picture, is this transporter localized on the outer, but also in the inner membrane. And if we have a knockout of this, it might prevent the 
remdesivir being transported into the matrix. And once remdesivir is in the matrix of mitochondria, it's where its um, action on the to like toxic toxic action is being happening. But um, if remdesivir and its active form is found in the cytoplasm, that that is where the remdesivir will act as an antiviral drug. So this kind of pictures uh, paints a really clear picture of what is happening within the cells. And we were able to do this by just doing this CRISPR screen and RNA-seq. And I would just like to take a moment to thank everyone in the lab for working really hard on this, uh, especially uh, Ersin and Minson who were working during our lockdown when we were quite limited with the people that we had in the lab, so they did majority of the work. Uh, I would also like to thank our collaborators, uh, Philippe Cole, uh, Professor Kapp, uh, David Artliu, uh, and our collaborators uh, who helped us with the, this viral challenge essay from Professor uh, David's lab. And I want to thank everyone for listening to my talk. Okay, awesome job. Well, we're all set pretty much from here. I will just do some quick editing on the front and back ends since there is no interruptions during, and then we'll have your presentation ready for the event next week. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Of course, any questions for me before we wrap up? Um, no. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Well, if anything comes up, feel free to reach out. But if not, the uh, event goes live next week on Wednesday if you want to attend live. If not, it'll be available on demand for six months after. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty. Have a great weekend. Thank you for your you time. Too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.